Um, but, but to come home as, as an example of with all we've learned and to show who we are. I've been all over the Spanish-speaking world and all throughout Europe, and everywhere I go, I look for gay and lesbian couples so I can ask them, what's your story? What was it like? I went to, I went to gay bars in the early 80s in, in Europe. Um, I went to, uh, to, to in, in South America shortly after some of the dictatorships had ended. I went to the, some of these uh, places that were just starting to have focus groups and, and talking about what the issues are. And as we, as we went home, we, we brought our stories with us and we brought strength with us and we brought what is today, what brought all of us together in this room in Marshall, Minnesota, to talk about this difficult and sensitive issue. I think it, this is just amazing how many of you are here tonight. I'm blown away and I'm truly personally honored that, that all of you are here. And it says some good things about Southwest State and it says some great things about Marshall. So thank you for being here. What can students that aren't residents of Minnesota do to stop bullying of LGBT, L, LBGTQ youth, people with disabilities, et cetera, people who aren't native here? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> one thing that you can do is when you hear people, and it, it was brought up, you know, saying, well, oh, that's so gay, you can stop them. And you can tell them, that offends me. And it doesn't matter if you're gay or not, that does offend people. And that is your way of stepping up and having the back of someone that is in that diverse group, whether they are gay, uh, student of color, disabled. That's your way. Or people saying that's retarded. That, to me, is offensive. My brother is high-functioning autistic. If I hear that, I do stop that, because that offends me, personally. And yeah, it comes different because I'm not the smallest guy in the world and they kind of do sometimes stop. But on the other hand, it maybe it kind of touches to them, well, you know, shoot, I maybe shouldn't have said that. And maybe they'll reevaluate what they say from now on. You're not going to help everyone. You're not going to get to everyone. But if you can stop one person, that's where it starts because then they can stop one or two. You can always write a letter to the media, either in your school paper or the town paper, in support of marriage, whether you're a citizen of the, the state or not. Um, and just talk about the fairness of marriage for all, wherever you go, whatever you do. Is there any precedent for using the Constitution to define a cultural institution like marriage? Um, actually, the Constitution is a very interesting subject to bring up. Um, a lot of people that do debates on same-sex marriage usually reference a case called Loving versus Virginia, which happened in 1967, which actually overturned the ban on interracial marriage, which is the marriage of two different races. And it just seems absurd today looking back on that and thinking that you know two different races couldn't marry. And if that hadn't happened, our President Barack Obama would not have been born to a marriage because his parents were white and black, so that's very interesting. But delving more into the Constitution is, is the 14th Amendment, which I will quote, which says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of a citizen of the United States, nor deny any person within jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, end quote. So I believe that that in itself is is a defense to why same-sex marriages should be legal. And I mean, our constitution was made to protect the rights of the minorities. LGBT people are in the minority. They only account for about 
roughly, of the U.S. population. And therefore, the Constitution actually would protect their rights, their fundamental right of marriage. What are other states doing to combat this? It only says this. <laughs> the LGBT discrimination. Yeah, let's go there. Well, LGBT discrimination. I don't think I'm the expert on what other states are doing in terms of um, combating LGBT discrimination. Um, in terms of what states are doing, each state, as we know, has their own set of laws and policies. And so there are different ways in which um, they're trying to promote LGBT equality or to pass LGBT marriage. Um, so we have North Carolina that I think is doing similar thing to what we're doing here. We have Maine that's still, I think Maine is still fighting for LGBT marriage. We've got California that overturned Proposition 8, and so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then we have states that are that need to like get rid of their sodomy laws, and they need to get rid of their um, <laughs> anti-discrimination in the workplace laws. So we've got states across the country that are on varying levels. I mean, we could go to Iowa and get married right now if we wanted to, um, but you know, I could go to California and be denied that. So we have states that are all over varying levels of equality and discrimination. Um, so I can say that as a general note, what's going on in the country. And on a national level, uh, you mentioned Proposition 8 is actually um, in the Court of Appeals right now, and it is prospected to actually reach the Supreme Court level within the coming years, at which the Supreme Court will rule on Proposition 8, just as they ruled, well, I don't know if the outcome is going to be the same, but it's similar circumstances of Loving versus Virginia. So. I mean, on a national level, things are being done from a state, so we have that to look forward to as well. And if the Supreme Court ruled the Proposition 8, the ban unconstitutional, that would in turn overrule majority of the state provisions that would ban. So that's kind of a nice thing. <laughs> All right, I know, I'm noticing that we're running short on time. So for the last question, how are you preparing for the voting in November? Like, what actions are being made? And I think, I think uh, specifically is what we're looking for. Uh, <coughs> one thing that I've been doing personally is educating not only myself, but others around our campus. Um, I'm actually very honored that Derek asked me to come talk tonight as being an ally. Uh, a lot of people don't realize what the marriage amendment is in itself, and if you open up your pamphlet, because I don't know how many of you actually did that, it tells you right there on the bottom of page one about the amendment. It tells you how it's going to be displayed on the ballot when you do, and I hope you do, go vote. Um, but besides that, I mean, educating yourself is the main thing that I want you guys to do. And then just don't make assumptions about, you know, the law in general, uh, what it might uh, do for the future, what it is going to try and overturn. Um, if you look at the bylaws and if you look at the, what the future and what we are doing now as a nation, it's just progressive. We don't live in 1965 anymore. I'm at a, well, a, divi a diverse school. So <laughs> that's one big thing that I want to throw out there is just educate yourself. Talk, talk about it. <laughs> talk to the people in this room. Talk to people on campus. Talk to your friends all over the state. Um, you know, nothing's going to change if we just ignore it. So just to reiterate, telling your story, bringing it up, you know, having those hard conversations. On Outfront's website, we have the how to talk. <laughs>